and it's actually my distinct pleasure to do so. Um, Dennis Plant is originally from South Carolina, but he grew up in South Georgia, where he developed an interest in archaeology at a young age. He earned his bachelor's at University of Georgia, a master's at Brown, and his PhD at the University of Virginia. He's currently an associate professor at James Madison University, and he's conducted research in North and Central America, including at some really small, very seldom heard of site on the James River, something called Jamestown in Virginia. Um, I actually, Dennis, you don't know, I actually worked at a site about a mile upriver at the confluence of the Chickahominy and the James River, um, a prehistoric site that uh, was a compliance project. And it was really boring, but it was really cool because I got to visit James. <laughs> absolutely loved it. Yeah. Um, I really want to go back to Jamestown again. Um, his research has made substantial contributions, advancing understanding of early Spanish contact in the American Southeast. Dr. Blanton has published extensively in Science, the International Journal of Historic Archaeology, Southeastern Geographer, Southeastern Archaeology, and Historic Archaeology, among many book chapters as well. He has published two books. First, he published Indian and European Contact in Context, The Middle Atlantic Region, published in 2004. And of course, this one here, Conquistador's Wake, Tracking the Legacy of Hernando de Soto in the Indigenous Southeast. That was published in 2020. I highly recommend that book. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Blanton, um, and I will stop sharing and, and turn it over to you, Dennis. Thank you, Bill. And, you know, I, I, I'm sort of, uh, I'll put my glasses on because I want to see, I, I recognize some of these people, right? It's like, this is like a, a little reunion. Yeah, we uh, invited and, a lot of the GARS group and the GAS group and some other people that might have worked with you at GLASS, as well as students from a number oh, of different universities. Oh, I know. This is, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's sort of exciting. On the other hand, it makes me nervous. Because, you know, most of these people I owe money to. And I know that's why they showed up. They're going to ask me to pay them back. <laughs> At any rate, uh, you know, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I appreciate the invitation. And th this is a really hard talk to give. And one of the, the main reason is that many of you know this project really well. And that's because you are an integral part of it. And that's one of the things that uh, I always say and I try to emphasize is that, uh, you know, I, I, my job seemed to be most of the time to go out to the site and wave my arms around and things, really good things happened because they were really good people there. And so uh, I don't want to review things that a lot of you already know, but I also know some of you are unfamiliar. So I, we're obligated to go through some of it. The most important part of any talk is the Q&A because that's when you get the opportunity to learn what you want to learn. And so I, I'm not going to, I'll try to keep this brief so that we can get to that sooner rather than later. But, you know, any part of this is, uh, is wide open. Uh, I, I'm, I never tire of talking about it. And I would say in a lot of ways, it's still a work in progress. So um, thank you again for having me. And what I'll do now is share my screen and we will rock and roll. Uh, this, this uh, the book that Bill mentioned is one that's a culmination of about a decade of work on the lower part of the York Mulgee. And I'll show you that uh, a map of that a little later just to make sure you're oriented properly. But the book is one that I wanted to write uh, that uh, made the story accessible to a really broad audience. You know, I, I write a lot of things for my peers. <laughs> And they're kind of a tough audience in a way, and but they, they expect a certain brand of writing that's not always uh, user friendly if you're not an archaeologist, and even if you are sometimes not user friendly. And you know, I thought, well, I want to write something that my mother might actually read, and I don't know she's really paid much attention to a lot of the other stuff, and so uh, that was part of the impetus. And any rate, if you if you haven't looked at the book, or if you have, you'll 
hopefully get that feel and uh, trying to, to walk the line between making it informative for colleagues, but also accessible for the general public. But um, I, I was sort of say, you know, on one level, it's a very personal account, but uh, there's a larger mission there behind the book. It's try to give people a sense of how archaeology really works and then what's the interface between archaeology and history and to really put a, an emphasis on the point that uh, we have to talk about history in the active voice. Uh, there's really uh, a lot of what we take for granted in terms of the historical narrative that dominates our country's conversations and things as fixed. And that's really not the way it is. Uh, there, there's, uh, most of us are out there toiling away, trying to improve the interpretation, uh, not to change it for change's sake, but to make it a little bit better. And that's one of the things I hope this, this project and this book contributes, is bringing a little bit more clarity to uh, a chunk of the world that's been neglected and a story that's always um, uh, hotly debated. Uh, where we're talking about is, uh, of course, uh, South Central Georgia. If I talk to people down there, they get annoyed if I say South Central. They just want to say Southeastern Georgia, but uh, I think South Central is on the lower Mulgee. In Telfair County, it was a primary location that we were working. The uh, glass site, for instance, is in Telfair County, but we were also venturing over the other side of the river to Coffee County, we're downstream a bit to Wheeler County and so forth. So uh, the, the, the project area in a sense was the entirety of the Big Bend. If you'll notice uh, the Okmulgee, uh, which is this line here, uh, and it eventually joins with the Oconee to form the Aldemaha, the Okmulgee takes a, a, a serious change in orientation uh, about the time you get to Telfair County and it goes from more or less north-south to essentially east-west. And so it's that east-west section that we were uh, doing most of our work. I also wanna orient you a little bit to uh, the geography of this, uh, we'll call it the 16th century, uh, of 16th century Georgia, as we know it, largely from the work of Charles Hudson and his colleagues. And uh, Dr. Hudson and these folks spent uh, many years trying to, well, they were revisiting the story of, of Hernando de Soto and trying to give us a better approximation of his path through the Southeast. And so the broad white line you see there is Hudson's approximation of that path. And there's a, a, a harder to see broken line uh, which is the estimation of the same path by John Swanton, who was attempting to do the same thing in the 1930s. And then you can see our project area uh, down in the Big Bend. But I've added to the map up along the Soda route, the named provinces, okay, that uh, Soto and his chroniclers described. And so in effect, if you were seeking to contribute to this body of work, uh, this is the received wisdom. This is what I learned in college. You know, I was I had taking classes with Charles Hudson and being around Chester de Pratt or Marvin Smith, this is what I learned. And so this is what it was in my head when we started the work at the glass site. It's like the Soto things in the bag. I mean, I was sort of, uh, guilty of assuming that it was a, a done story. Well, um, what I set out to do down there was it had nothing to do with Hernando de Soto or any conquistador at all. But I just want to make sure it's clear to you that the, the period we're talking about is really the first chapter, some would say the first couple of chapters in not just the history of Georgia, but the history of the Southeast. And we're talking about that period of Spanish domination that preceded the period of English domination, which of course was ushered in by James Oglethorpe and his establishment of the colony, the English colony at Savannah. 
Uh, so there's this 200 years, and you know, a lot of people are like, what, you know, this 200 years? If, you know, if I go to a, like a, 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 a school or a civic club and I say, okay, who recorded the first history in Georgia? Everybody's hand goes up and everybody's eyes get big and they can't wait to answer. And almost always they'll say Oglethorpe. And so you have to remind folks that there's this earlier era that um, really accounts for what's called the, the opening phase of the historical period in the state that's very dim because the records are incomplete and the archaeology is still uh, in progress. So there's a lot to be learned. Now, I'll point out in this, this sort of these chronological bullet points, my point of interest <laughs> when we started this project was the one on the bottom. Uh, and that's the Spanish mission period. My goal was to go down there to South Georgia and find this Spanish mission called Santa Isabel de Utinajica. That's the most remote of all the missions in the, the Spanish Catholic network in La Florida. Uh, I had been working with the St. Catherine's collection, had done some work at St. Catherine's when I was a graduate student. And so really wanted to find this mission because it'd be like the perfect contrast uh, to St. Catherine's. We had a very rich mission at St. Catherine's and had a very poor one at Santa Isabel. So that's really my, was my, my goal. Um, if you don't know, these missions are fascinating. There's been a lot of great archaeology around it. If you, if you look at the Spanish archaeology in Toto for the region, this by far is where most of it has focused. And um, we know a lot as a result about these sites. And we have a sense of the architecture, um, the sense of the activities and so forth. And they follow the pretty much a cookie cutter plan. And there were always three principal buildings. There was the Iglesia or the church. There was the Convento, which is where the friar stayed. And then there was the, the Cocina, which is where the, the kitchen essentially. And this is just a, a, an artist interpretation of the church building at the famous mission of San Luis down at Tallahassee. If you haven't been there, you should go there. And for a couple of reasons, they do wonderful living history. They've reconstructed the site and they have a fabulous museum with a lot of the artifacts in it. But this is sort of what I was imagining we would find or some semblance of it uh, when we began our work on the Mulvey. So that was the, what we were anticipating. What actually happened was something else. And so on the one hand, you know, what I want to say to you, if there's any takeaway, maybe uh, you could write this down. Maybe you could put it, make a bumper sticker out of it. No archeological site is to be trusted. Okay. Don't trust any of them. They're full of all kinds of ugly surprises. Maybe not ugly surprises, but they're full of surprises. And that's kind of what happened in, uh, in this case, is we set to work on this mission search and we started finding all these things that uh, neither I nor anyone else expected we would find. And we started to find those things really quickly. Uh, and so uh, the, what I'm talking about, well, let me back up. If you're, if you were a Spanish missionary, your focal point were the natives, the indigenous people. And so if you're going to search for a Spanish mission site, the starting point is to find the native villages from that period. They always occur together, they always occur together. And so that's what I did working with people like Frankie Snow. We came up with a short list of sites and um, they were Native American villages. Well, we started excavating on these things. And if you've looked at the book and some of you know this story, uh, I was working at Fernbank Museum of Natural History where they deserve huge credit for this project. They sponsored it for years and they still sponsor some of the work that I do. 
The collections from the project are still there. So Fernbank was central to the whole endeavor. Uh, and being a, a museum as it is, we started the whole project with some educational programs, some of which you participated in. Uh, one of week of that in the first year involved high school students. And uh, this young lady, Ellen Vaughn, was uh, working hard on the screen. And Ellen was one of these very, she's like the, the strong silent type, you know, she was always uh, on her game but she didn't have a lot to say. And, uh, but one day she's screening and she sort of summons me over, which was remarkable in itself because she never wanted any kind of attention. And I walked over and she opened up her hand and you know, she said, well, is this anything? And uh, you know, my knees buckled because you know, there in the palm of her hand was this glass bead. And I knew right away that uh, this was not typical of the mission period, but something else. So then I wandered off into the woods for several hours and walked in circles and scratched my head and thrashed around because I had no idea what to make of this discovery because it, it defied our expectations as far as the mission goes. Well, long story short, uh, over the course of several years, doc working with uh, Dr. Glover, and his wonderful students, and uh, many of you who were volunteering, we wound up amassing a, a really impressive collection of early uh, European artifacts, most of which we tend to attribute to Spanish activity. And so we've got a bunch of these beads and uh, we got things like this distinctive kind of a bell, we got a silver pendant, we got iron tools, which are very diagnostic of the 16th century. We got this iron ax uh, and so on and so forth. And here's, here's the upshot of it. Nary an object, nary an object in this large collection of European things is uh, typical of the mission period. None of it. And so, you know, we're left with this, uh, in, in some ways, a quandary. It was kind of an exciting quandary, but we had to get to the bottom of it. So this meant that as an archeologist, I felt this professional obligation to change my research design. It's not that I lost total interest in the mission, but I literally felt this professional obligation to get to the bottom of this discovery, this unanticipated discovery. So, uh, you know, we, we continued to work at the site for many years to try to get to the bottom of it. And I dare say we don't have total closure, but I, in my mind, we have uh, some plausible explanations for it. So that's, that's the, uh, literally the tangible evidence, okay, for this interaction we'll call it this sort of entanglement between uh, the indigenous people at this village and an early Spanish party. Uh, it would be wrong, literally uh, wrong for me to neglect the native community. Uh, most of what we were finding there day in and day out were Native American artifacts. And that in itself, I mean, even absent the Spanish material, this would have been a fairly notable contribution for this part of South Georgia. Uh, there had, when, when, I was, when I was growing up in, you know, in South Georgia and when I was going to college, uh, you, you, if, if, you, if you're attached to South Georgia, you kind of develop this complex <laughs> because you know, uh, you're like a cracker. Uh, nobody wants to go there. Uh, nothing happens there unless you, you know, want to hunt hogs or something. And um, the same is true historically. Is that, you know, it's like, well, nothing happened there. Nobody was home. And this was true even of Native America. It's like the Native Americans didn't even love South Georgia. And, and this is, this was, again, received wisdom. Uh, and there were archaeologists predecessors of mine uh, who are writing books. I mean, there's literally a book written by the former state archaeologist of Georgia that said the coastal plain was uh, a, uh, a, a basically 
lacking in sufficient resources, believe it or not, to sustain uh, agriculturalists or quasi-agriculturalists during the Mississippian period. But it's, nobody was seeing those sites down there. It's not like, you know, we have Etowahs and things in that part of the world. And so you say, okay, well, it's just nobody wanted to be there. Well, we've now have had to adjust our, our understanding of particularly this part of South Georgia, which we call, uh, you know, the, the, the real Piney Woods district and the Flatwoods district that uh, is, is kind of unique, but it doesn't mean to say there's nobody home. Uh, we found lots of material evidence. And uh, when we started, I remember, you know, Jeffrey Glover would come down and uh, working with his students and other folks, we, we decided, well, we better get a handle on the extent of this village. And I had this idea that was going to be fairly modest in size and maybe not a village at all. And um, we started doing the shovel testing and not only finding copious quantities of artifacts, but uh, in the end, uh, we learned that the distribution of these artifacts gave us this uh, footprint of a large community. And you can see here that the yellow and the orange colors represent the high density areas for Native American pottery. And so it's pretty much your classic circular village with an open plaza in the middle. And we now know from testing a lot of those hot spots that they represent the locations of buildings, dwellings, and then other sorts of buildings. And so, you know, we had to really recalibrate again our notion about uh, Native American population and activity and so forth during the late Mississippian period as part of Georgia. And this is what we think that that town probably looked like based on our archaeology there. Uh, one of the buildings that we found, in fact, is sort of the, for, fortunately, I suppose, a starting point for uh, the job turned out to be a much larger than average structure. Uh, you can see on the left there it had this giant hearth. This hearth was about two meters across, uh, had this just amazing deposit of ash over it. it was finely layered. We found these giant post holes that held the uprights for the center of the building. And um, after a few years, we really began to see what it represented. And this is a, an artist's reconstruction of interpretation of that structure, which was, a, it's a what we call a public building as opposed to a standard uh, dwelling. And uh, it was about uh, between 11 and 12 meters on the side. Uh, it had a ditch around it. It was enclosed by this boundary. The interior was full of uh, all kinds of uh, artifacts that were suggestive of elite status, uh, shell beads, shell ear pins, um, so on and so forth. And so anyway, you know, these buildings are the kind of public structures that don't occur on just any Native American site of the era. They tend to occur on sites that uh, have some um, influence and oftentimes are referred to somewhat loosely as capital towns. And so at the end of it, uh, I think we could say with a straight face that the glass site uh, which is the place we're talking about, was probably serving as the capital town of a Native American province there. Uh, and if you'll recall that Soto map, there are no named provinces uh, where our project was. So again, we were trying to sort all this out. Um, here is a, a map of the area that shows the majority of the, the uh, late Mississippian contact period sites in that part of the world, and you can see they're tightly clustered there. If you move away from this area, you simply don't see sites with these components. Uh, you have to travel uh, 60, 50 uh, kilometers away, sometimes 100 kilometers away before you see another concentration like that. 
And so uh, the other thing I want to point out, and we could go there later, but we think there were three capitals at different times within the province. They're indicated by these red dots. The glass site uh, was uh, one of the earliest. And then the last one was known as the Lind site. And uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to come back to questions in a little bit. Uh, one of the longtime participants in the project who's since gone on and gotten her PhD and now is working at a university herself, Rachel Hensler, uh, she did her dissertation working with uh, ceramics from this part of the world and did a nifty study looking at different attributes of ceramics. And this is one of several graphics, but uh, it just shows how we can track the chronology of these capital towns from earliest to latest. And so uh, we think the glass site was the earliest, this one called Coffee Bluff next, and then Lynn Landing, the last one. This is based on uh, complicated stamped uh, patterns, uh, which are, are, they differ from place to place. Uh, the, you know, the upshot of all this is that um, we had this uh, irrefutable uh, evidence, I think, of some kind of encounter between exploring Europeans in the 16th century and this polity, this native territory at the, at the time, the capital town of the glass site. And um, I have argued and will continue to argue until there's evidence to the contrary that the majority of these 16th century artifacts originated with the Entrada of Hernando de Soto. And um, I'll explain why that might be so. If you're not familiar with uh, our friend Hernando, uh, he spent uh, over three years wandering the Southeast. He, he started his expedition in 1539, somewhere in the vicinity of Tampa Bay and wound up dying on the banks of the Mississippi River in 1542. But uh, before it was all over, his party had gone as far west as Texas and so on. And the survivors made their way back down to uh, Mexico um, by 1543. Uh, so here's that map again that shows uh, the, the uh, favored path of Charles Hudson of the DeSoto route. And you see the named uh, provinces there. And so the challenge for us was to say, does this province that I've highlighted here around the glass site actually represent one of the provinces that um, Hudson was describing? And the, it, it's still subject to debate, but I think it just might uh, represent one of the named provinces on the Hudson route and therefore the Hudson route requires an adjustment. Uh, I'll give you some larger context here. And uh, one of the things Charles Hudson always said to his students, uh, and one of the things he always makes a point of, of stating in his writing is that archeology span will settle the score. And that the route, the, the path that he put together really represents what I will call as a giant hypothesis. It was his best estimation of that path based on the evidence at his disposal. And the evidence at his disposal was, of course, the writings of Soto's chroniclers and archaeology. So you ask yourself, what are the firm anchor points, archeologically speaking, for this route? In other words, where have archeologists identified artifacts that are potentially diagnostic of this period? And here's the map. Now I haven't included a few spots down on the coast, which would have something to do with other Spanish um, expeditions. But you'll notice uh, these numbered dots all represent the places we have the right kind of stuff. 
before we started work at the glass site. The last one in Florida is at Tallahassee. But between Tallahassee, Florida and the Berry site up here at the, the, the toe of the Blue Ridge in North Carolina, there's nothing. So archaeology is still left to pin down in some concrete way where this path really is. And so everything in between is subject to revision in my opinion. Uh, da, 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 da. We don't really need to well, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, of course, trying to understand the glass site, but, uh, and I've opened the aperture to look at everything we know about Soto. And I've put together this version of the same map, and you'll notice that it's shaded in different colors. The, each shaded area represents a season of March. Starting down here at Tampa Bay, the darkest shaded area is the first season of March. Then they spent the winter at Tallahassee where number 15 is. In the spring of 1540, they left Tallahassee, marched northward, we think this way, and then they spent the next winter over here in Mississippi. Then after that, they made their way out to Arkansas, Texas, so on and so forth. And so these are the three main segments of March, but separated by their winter stopovers. So what I've done is gone into all of the archeological records from these known sites and asked myself, what kind of artifacts do we see? And might we see some patterns? And so here's the distribution of iron tools. Bunch of iron tools in Florida. Then you get up here in the second uh, season of March up in the Appalachians, uh, including areas like the King site and Etowah, up close to where you are, of course, right now. Uh, you see a good number of iron tools. And then after that, you see almost none. Military gear. You see a little bit of it in Florida. You see most of it up here in the Appalachians. And then at the same point, it just dies. Okay. This is Alabama, right? Everybody knows, God bless Alabama. Personal items. These are things like beads. Uh, they would be, you know, buttons. I don't know, personal things. We'll call them that. That's sort of a generic category for that sort of thing. Most of that's in Florida. And you get a little bit up here, but nothing in between. But again, you get into Alabama, it's gone. Anybody want to hazard a guess what happens in Alabama while they turn the spigot off? There was this, in, this uh, fateful coordinated attack by the natives at this village of Mabila. And it just about did the expedition in. And a lot of the supplies that uh, Soto's party was carrying were uh, captured or destroyed. And the Soto party was, they were, you talk about a bunch of paupers after that. They had to dress like natives, they had to fashion a lot of their own tools. They had to refashion metal they could scavenge into things and so forth. And so they simply had nothing to give away anymore. And I think we're seeing some of that in the archeological record now. Um, 
it still leaves the, the area where the glass site is and we just, we don't have anything. There might be a reason for that, which I'll share with you in a moment. This is a map I did uh, not long ago, just looking at uh, glass beads in the Altamaha drainage. So here's the Altamaha River, the Okmulgee, Oconee, it goes all the way up into the Piedmont near Athens, right? And Macon. Uh, the, the, the dot, the long and short of the dots on this map that are either black or mostly black, solid black, uh, are the old beads. They're 16th century beads. And uh, the beads that are white, or I mean the dots that are white represent mission period beads. They're largely 17th century beads. And so there's a pattern here. You do get some early beads down on the coast, which probably have to do with some of the early expedition like Ion and so forth. It may be, maybe the French, but less so. Then you get some early beads are here at the glass site, but that's about it. And so the, the current path that puts Soto's route up here in the Piedmont of Georgia is not based on the occurrences of 16th century artifacts. The only thing up there so far is 17th century artifacts. And in fact, one of the things I have to still shake my head over is that Macon, Georgia, which is also on the Hudson Path, is the place where, uh, well, Macon has been excavated to death and there's no, no 16th century artifacts. There's a lot of 17th century artifacts, but no 16th century. So, you know, we're, we, we, we're left, in other words, with a single place in Georgia that's not on the coast that's produced the right kind of artifacts for a Soto camp. Now we could ask, uh, you know, we go back to this map here and you say, okay, why is there nothing between Tallahassee and the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina? Well, one of the things I did was to go in and look at Soto's, the chronicles about Soto and uh, ask myself how many how long were they staying in any one place? And so you see this big spike here. This is the winter camp at Tallahassee. Then you get the winter camp over there in Mississippi. And then you get another one out on the banks of the, of the river. And um, you can see right here between Tallahassee and the middle of South Carolina, which is about where the, we think the village of Kofodacheki was, they weren't staying very long. They were a hustler. They get up here in the Appalachians and in Alabama, and before they get to Mobila, they're lingering a little bit longer. And I think leaving more artifacts. So one of the reasons we're not seeing much between Tallahassee and the mountains is because they're in a hurry. Why are they in a hurry? Why are they in a lather to get to the mountains? They wanted the gold. That's where they were told the precious metal was. And so they were booking it up there. Now, Kofodacheki was another uh, target because they were told that it was the richest place and might have gold as well. So long story short, if we look at all these threads of evidence, I think there is a, a, an argument to be made for considering an adjustment to the Soto path through Georgia that takes it either to or near the glass site. And that's about all I can suggest. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't speak yet to any of the other sections of it because we don't have new evidence there to support the case. But that's really, you know, where we're left with the, the, uh, the implications of the story. Uh, as I said at the outset, I think a lot of this tells us that these, these cases are uh, like the DeSoto question and even the mission question is very much a work in progress and that archaeology will be the, the final arbiter, at least I'd like to think that 
that it is. Now, the, the last thing there, change is hard. Um, a lot of my colleagues have welcomed these results and they have supported this interpretation, but not all of them. Uh, you know, I want you to know right away that there are, there are colleagues of mine out there uh, who were good friends, but uh, they're not prepared to say that the Hudson route should be shifted to the glass site. And we can talk about why they might uh, argue that, but I'll stop there and um, entertain your questions. I think that's probably the- Thank you, Dennis. That was, that was absolutely wonderful uh, overview of your research at the glass site and in the region and <clears throat> of DeSoto's route, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we do have a few questions. At this point, I'll read through the questions and you can answer them, address them. Uh, one person wrote, how do you date the beads? You, well, you know that I, I give this analogy to students all the time is that like, you know, if we went out and stood by, I don't know, name a highway, we stood out by the highway and we watched the cars go by, we could date those cars pretty quickly based on body style. And um, uh, material culture is prone to uh, cha uh, pattern change. And this was true of glass beads. And the, the glass bead industry of the 16th and 17th century was a highly competitive business and they were trying to attract uh, buyers, consumers. And we know that from today, um, the, uh, the manufacturers and the retailers will change styles on a fairly regular basis to attract new attention. And so beads are the same way. They were undergoing these, these changes fairly regularly. And uh, it's good for us archeologists because we now know we can look at a bead of a particular type and know that it dates to a particular period. Now there's some, it's always, not always as easy as that, but that's a simple answer. It, you know, it's like if you, know, if you look at an old photograph and you look at the hemlines and the hairstyles and the eyeglass styles, you can say, oh, well, that's the 1940s or that's the 1960s or whatever. So it's that kind of analogy. Thank you. <clears throat> Another individual wrote, how do you decide uh, when to move on from a site? Oh boy. Uh... And I don't you know, know if they mean how does how did DeSoto know to move on, or how do you we as archaeologists know to move on? I don't yeah. I don't know. Yeah, which I'm going to assume it means archaeologists. Yeah. For yeah. now, and uh, I will. Here here's the here's the bottom line. Good archaeology begins with good questions. None of us has any business undertaking a project unless you have a compelling reason to do so, a compelling question. My opening question had to do with this mission site. Then it changed, right, to understanding the unexpected 16th century evidence. We reached a point where I thought we had enough, okay, to make a, a, a plausible explanation and being mindful that we don't want to dig a site away. You know, there's this, there's this sort of, uh, there's this ethic in archeology span that's uh, very much a, you know, a strong strain of preservation. And uh, these sites are precious. And the, the last thing we usually want to do is excavate them to death. You, could, you can love a site to death and that's not always a good thing. And so I felt like we had reached a point where not only could we make a plausible argument for you know an, an interpretation, but um, uh, we also needed to get it out there. You know, it excavation can consume you, field work can consume you, and it can generate so much stuff that it would take forever to write it up. And I didn't want to be in that kind of a situation where I had so much information, I couldn't deal with it. I couldn't, I couldn't get my arms around it. And so we just called a big timeout. 
And so there's a lot that could be done on any of these sites. You know, they, they're not exhausted. And I'd still like to go back. I mean, the mission question's still open. So if I went back to that part of the world, it would be to return to the opening question and try to find the mission. And I think we know where it might be. But at any rate, it's all about good questions. Absolutely. Uh, Ken Aikens writes, uh, when I lived on the Georgia coast, my research interpreted the name Altamaha as meaning on the way to Tama, mm -hmm. an important village at the confluence of the Okmulgee and the Oconee. Could the glass site or one of the other villages at this confluence be Tama? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Totally. Totally. In fact, there was a, a, an avocational historian named Sam Lawson. If you, and you may know Sam's work. I hope you do. If you don't, look up Sam Lawson's work. He published some articles, and including one in early Georgia. But at any rate, uh, Sam Lawson, uh, I think, uh, built a, a very persuasive argument for the existence of Tama basically at the Forks, uh, you know, within that area. And so it's possible that this province is Tama. And I don't know. We... There's an article that just we've just gotten published about this province where we are, and we say that it says one of the leading candidates would be Tama. Now Tama goes by different names. It's also known as Altamaha, and so forth. But yes, I couldn't agree more. It's uh, it, I think it, if it's one of the named provinces, it's going to be either Ichizi or um, Tama. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, someone else wrote, how large a group were the Sotos? How big a party did the Soto have? Yeah, yeah. about uh, 600 people. Um, man, <laughs> uh, yeah, they were a bunch of mercenaries for sure. Uh, they, you know, they mainly were these sort of soldier of fortune types. But I mean, by by far, I mean, say, you know, maybe 90 plus percent of them. But as is customary for any Spanish venture anywhere for anything, you had Catholic clergy. And so there were a handful of Catholic clergy. They also had specialists, uh, you know, they had blacksmiths. Uh, they had people to take care of horses and they had pigs. And anyway, so there was a, there were some you know, artisan types and things there as well, but about 600 people and 600 people, 250 horses and Lord knows how many pigs. I mean, they were like rabbits by, you know, they probably had a few when they started by the time they hit Georgia, it was barbecue every night. <laughs> <laughs> you know that, right? First barbecue in Georgia was, I'm sure with <laughs> soda. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, someone else writes, how did this site get chosen? That, that's a great question, too. Like I said at the beginning, we were looking for the mission, and I, what I wanted was a, a short list of six sites. And the strategy was to do limited testing at all six sites and then see which one uh, appeared to be the, the strongest candidate for the mission site. You know, we're going to continue narrow it down in stages. Well, uh, as I mentioned, Frankie Snow is, uh, he's, he's native of those parts. He's a, a avocational archeologist, he, but he's, I mean, I treat him like a professional. And um, we consulted on what sites should be on that list. And he told me about one. I mean, when I started the project, I hadn't spent much time in South Georgia for a number of years. And he said, well, there's this new site there's this new place that these hunters found. And, um, the, you know, they brought me this shoebox full of artifacts and it's all really late, you know, like Lamar pottery. And um, I went out there and it seems to maybe have some midden accumulation here and there and so on. And he says, you know, I, I don't know much about it, but there it is. And so we put it at the bottom of the list. We put the glass site at the bottom of the list. <laughs> of that list of six. 
And we started at this place called Coffee Bluff. And we started there because uh, someone that Frankie knows had found a piece of Spanish ceramic of, of my Holica. And so, you know, it's like, hey, why not start where there's already a Spanish artifact? Well, we went out and worked and some of you worked there. I see Russ and Witt uh, with us and they were there and we never found any more Spanish things, which is still puzzles me, but nonetheless, almost in desperation, we said, well, we gotta, let's try somewhere else. And so we kind of punted and went over to the glass site and boom, there, there we go. Excellent. Uh, how big were the glass beads? It's another question. They're about the size of a garden pea. And, you know, or maybe imagine the end of an old fashioned pencil or, you know, a pencil with the, the eraser, you know, the little, that they're, they're not large at all. They're very easy to miss. And this was, uh, we, we knew that glass beads of any, there you go, there it is. Thank you, Manny. And um, glass beads of any sort would be uh, kind of telltale indicators of Spanish site, including a mission. And so when we started, we had uh, designed our sampling strategy for bead recovery. So we were using really fine screen and we're doing a lot of water screening. And um, that really accounts for our success in finding the beads was doing water screening. We did it more than one way, but it, it really produced a bunch of them. There were some were found. Someone else in, writes. No, go Sorry, ahead. go ahead. Keep... No, there's some of the beads were actually found in situ, which was really cool. I remember one of Jeffrey's students excavated one in situ. That was exciting. A couple of other people did, but most were found in the screen. Thank you. Uh, someone else writes, are there other sites you're interested in excavating based on your DeSoto research? Yes, and now I'm, uh, I, I've carried the project in a sense, a uh, hundred, a little over a hundred miles to the west in southwestern Georgia and have been working over there since 2007 and sort of on and off since 2007. And I've been back in recent years on a regular basis, but that area is uh, what Soto called uh, Kapacheki. And let me see. Uh, if you can, can you see that? Uh, this is Kapacheki here. This is the Chattahoochee River. This is the Flint River. Uh, this wow. is one of the named provinces. Dennis, you have to share your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I. I, I he is sharing. I can see it. Oh. Oh, can you? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm blocking you. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. It's all right. I want to make sure everybody sees it. But there's uh, this area of Kapacheki that was, uh, you know, Hudson and others said, you know, this is where it is. And there's no reason to doubt that. And so basically got this. So much about this is, is comes by. It's unanticipated. And this invitation to go work over there was unanticipated. But I took up the invitation in part because I wanted to find another dot. Uh, put another dot on the DeSoto map archaeologically. And we've been working over there um, for a long time. Uh, Dr. Glover has helped over there in the early going. Uh, several of you have worked over there in the recent going. And um, we have Spanish artifacts. We got Spanish artifacts. And here's the irony. Here's the irony of all ironies. This is what drives you crazy. We went to we went to the to uh, the Okmulgee to find mission period artifacts, and we wound up finding Soto artifacts. We went to Kapacheki to find the Soto artifacts, and we wound up finding mission period artifacts. <laughs> and so, I am not going to claim that there was a mission there. Uh, pretty, I think we can safely say that. But there were. Uh, natives uh, who were somehow linked to the mission, probably at San Luis, who were bringing some artifacts up there, which of course is part of the 
trick interpreting these European things is that they are highly portable. And so it's a mistake to automatically assume that the, the place of their discovery is the place of the interaction. So anyway, um, yes, and I'll be back down at Kapacheki area this summer, God willing. And, uh, you know, the pandemic sort of cramps the style. I usually take students, but and I'm still trying, but we'll see. I'll be there regardless, and you're all welcome to come down. You actually uh, dug right into two of the next questions. Uh, someone asked, what are the odds that these artifacts are transported to these locations as trading hubs by Native Americans versus being left behind by DeSoto? Yeah. And then they also asked if you have future plans to quest for the mission. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. No, the, uh, you know, what we call the portability problem is very real. And, uh, you know, I go to some length to address that in the book and elsewhere. Um, in the case of Kapacheki, it makes a lot of sense because we have very few and they're of limited sorts. Uh, it's harder to apply the portable, the sort of the the relocated object explanation at the glass site because we have so much stuff outside of graves uh, and such a diversity of stuff. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll just tell you there's nowhere uh, where you find that quantity and that diversity, does anybody say that they're, you know, relocated objects? I usually call it a pretty primary location. That would be true of any of these winter encampments and so on. It, it, it's possible, but if, if that's what it is, it would, it's highly unusual. And that's another- Do you have any evidence? Yeah, I'll just say that another peculiar thing about the glass site is, you know, all of these European artifacts are found outside of grave context. And the, Almost everywhere in the Southeast where you find Spanish artifacts on sites, they're in Native American graves. It's very, very unusual to find them outside of graves. We found none in graves. Well, maybe one, but that's something else. And uh, the winter encampment at Tallahassee, they had a, a goodly number of Spanish artifacts, a good diversity. None of them were in graves. And so, you know, I, again, I just explained that I am applying the criteria that my colleagues apply to identify other DeSoto sites. If I apply the, the criteria that they have applied, then the glass site has to be one. <laughs> if the glass site is not one, then none of them are. It's as simple as that. Or, or we have to work with another set of criteria. You know, you can't have it both ways. And at uh, any rate, uh, there you go. Thank you. Another question, uh, does the evidence suggest how long the glass site may have been occupied? It, we, have, uh, we have some radiocarbon dates and um, yeah, we have, we have ceramics and this, that, and the other. It's a... a, a I would say less than a hundred years. So I'm thinking probably on the order of three, I, I, my head, I want to say three generations, you know? So let's say in those days, maybe a generation, we'll call it 25 years, you know, biologically. And um, so, yeah, I'd say maybe between 50 and a hundred years. Okay. The, uh, the radiocarbon, question. yeah, I'm sorry, Bill, the radiocarbon sorry. dates bracket, it's about uh, 1450 to 1550, you know, to the extent you can get that precision. Another question, and you've already touched on this a little bit, are there student groups that can go to these sites? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's really what I, I, I love to do is work with students and 
Uh, we had a lot of them at the glass site, particularly the Georgia State University field schools for a number of years. Uh, we have had University of Georgia students. We've had Georgia Southern students. We've had, uh, you know, my students down there and then plus volunteers. So I, I welcome those kind of, of collaborative things. And then one last typed up question. And then after this question, we'll open it up uh, for anybody to ask questions. Uh, where's the modern day location of Toa? It appears to be on the Flint. And this person says, I grew up on the Flint at Camp Thunder, Dripping Rock, Molina, Woodbury, uh, Ups in Mer Merriweather County. Yeah, Toa is uh, you know, John Worth, and he'll he'll be speaking to you next month. You should talk to to John about Toa. His master's thesis actually was about trying to identify the location of Toa, and um, but yes, it's a Flint River site for sure. It's the next province upstream from Kapacheki, the place that I've been working recently. And um, there, there's a couple of mound sites there that very likely represent the capital towns in Toa, at least at one point. And it's getting up, I think those mound sites are getting up toward Taylor County, I believe, I mean, southern, southern Taylor County, what I want to say. All right, and I actually have a question for you too. If, if you can go back in your slides Mm -hmm. to that uh, slide with the map of the metal artifacts. Uh, let's see. Yeah, any of those. Do you, uh, Oh, you mean the distribution? Yeah, the, the map with the distribution, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, right there, any of those, the iron tools. Uh, in those areas where you <clears throat> you don't have any iron tools that are represented, do you think that's a sampling bias that <laughs> well, there's no yeah, there's no question uh, that that's true uh, in in a lot of the area. Yeah, but so you know, my, you gotta, my question you, is then to, to, to follow. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, sampling is just a problem across the board. But, you know, I would just point out that, uh, you know, this segment of this route in the Macon area has been excavated to death. You moved up to this segment right here, the Oconee and the Wallace Reservoir area, it's been excavated to death. You move up to the Savannah River, a lot of attention there. You move up to Central South Carolina, and people have worked their hearts out to find the stuff. So the samples have been retrieved, at least archaeological samples, but they haven't included right recovery of Spanish material. And so it's not for this total dearth, right, of work by any stretch. Um, but you can't deny that there's not been enough work anywhere. Now out here, um, same thing. I mean, people have worked all through this area in Alabama. There has been like concerted efforts to find Mabila and some of the other name sites there by, you know, um, well, uh, Jim Knight and anyway, a bunch of the prominent folks over there and they haven't found them. So they've tried. Mm -hmm. So if that's what you mean by sampling, it's, yeah, not lack, just, it's not lack of effort sampling. Yeah. It's maybe just looking in the wrong place. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm curious how that north Northwest Georgia section of the route has so, it's so well represented here with iron tools. Is it, mm -hmm. is it that um, um, they were identified properly and you think they might've been misidentified at other at other sites or? No, uh, I'll tell you exactly what's going on uh, through that whole stretch up here in the Appalachians. The re one reason there's yeah. so many dots is that uh, the pot hunters have recovered this stuff from graves. And Marvin Smith, <laughs> Marvin Smith's dissertation, which looked at the distribution of Spanish artifacts in the Southeast is his database 
uh, was heavily, was compiled heavily from uh, interviews, consultations with looters. And uh, that's why we know about a lot of those sites. And this is part mm -hmm. of the problem. Now, when I, when I plot these things, it's really simply presence, absence. Sure. I don't use uh, uh, frequency data. So the sizes of these circles don't represent numbers of any single, single iron tool. They represent numbers of different categories. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Sure, sure. Which is simply the presence of absence or of a particular category of iron tool. So if there's any number of axes that counts, you get a one for axes. Sure. There's any number of celts, you get a one for celts and so on. Because there's no question that the, and, and a lot of, and, and you get up here in North Carolina, a lot of this is Smithsonian Institution data from the, from the 19th century and early 20th century. You can't trust it. No. And so, you know, you're left with this ragged data set and the only way to make it manageable is to say presence, absence. That's the only solution I have. Yeah. Anyway, I hope that Thank makes, you. makes well, sense. I'm gonna, it absolutely does. It clears up a lot. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to anyone else. I'm going to hit the ask all to unmute. So if you have questions or comments, go ahead and feel free to unmute yourself. I've got a question, Bill. Can you hear Go me? Ahead, Cliff. Yep. Uh, is there anything in DeSoto's journal, uh, the various journals that were uh, written about his uh, expedition, that would point to the to the glass site? Is there anything you can correlate with his journals? The uh, nothing. Well. Yes and yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> who who am I speaking to? Uh, this is Cliff Cliff Shaw. Okay, uh, Cliff. Um, there's there's a couple of things that are in the chronicles, and one is a mention of uh, they recognized when they left the Gulf coastal plain and entered the Atlantic coastal plain. They understood uh, that they were, were moving into a, a river basin that flowed into the Atlantic. And they also noted that uh, this first river uh, changed its orientation from east to west. It's the first river they hit that had that orientation. And so that's one reason we think it's the Okmulgee River. And uh, so that's a clue. Beyond that, there, I mean, there's sort of, if you look at the, all the wonderful work that uh, even Swanton and Hudson and uh, of course, Marvin Smith, Chester Pratter, all those people have done, they did this painstaking analysis of uh, distances traveled. The Spanish have talked about how many leagues they traveled. And so they, they, they took those clues. They looked at uh, topography, river crossings, river orientations, and all, and all kinds of things. And at any rate, if you, if you take into account all those clues, meager as they are, then it points strongly to at least the Okmulgee. Uh, not necessarily the glass site, but the lower part of the Oak Mulgee. Now, the interesting thing is that, that Swanton, who was the first one to do a modern analysis of the route, put the Soto's route pretty darn close to the glass site. And, uh, and Hudson decided that that was not uh, accurate, and he moved it up to Macon. He moved it well upstream, almost 100 miles. Uh, but, you know, I think maybe in some respects, Swanton was reading these meager clues maybe more correctly when it comes to the crossing point of the Okmulgee than Hudson was. But, you know, I'm not trying to take either group to task severely, but it's just to make the point that this is, it's tricky business trying to, to uh, pin it down based on this evidence. They're clues, clues but they're only very suggestive clues. Thank you. Thank you. 
I would like to comment on that. This is Mr. Melvin. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, you may recall, I've been interested in this for many years. And uh, I gave uh, Professor Hudson a copy of my paper years ago when he first started uh, <clears throat> become interested in this. But uh, you touched on one of the two uh, definite points. The eastern flowing river has got to be the Okamogi or the Ultimo. And then, of course, they also uh, later on crossed the Blue Ridge and went uh, into the headwaters of the Tennessee River. So you have those two points. And uh, your glass site. Uh, is exactly on the point of the Okamulgee River that I proposed years and years ago. Uh, I agree that, that you can't identify a particular site, but that's where it is. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll mention uh, two other things just real briefly. After they cross this river and uh, in, in canoes, it's a big river, they had to cross it in canoes. Uh, they they were helped by the chief of Okudi. Right. <clears throat> and uh, after they came to his village, they went upriver. Up so obviously, the Okamogi River is flowing generally northwest to southeast. They must have been going to the west for a few days. Mm -hmm. And that brings to the glass site, in my opinion. <clears throat> I'll also mention, uh, and this should be of interest to the other members, I'm not familiar with your organization. But nobody has mentioned the Peachtree site on the Hiawassee River. Oh, yeah, that's a port of uh, Western North Carolina, just above the Georgia line. There's a treasure trove of Spanish artifacts, these same type of artifacts, there. Yeah. Well, thank you for those comments. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, the Peachtree site's really interesting. It's It's got a some 16th century things and 17th century things on it. Uh, any other questions? I'll tell you what, I'm gonna have to uh, sign off in about, well, by 8.30. Uh, I've got another thing I have to attend to and I apologize for that, but uh, we've got a couple of minutes. <clears throat> Yeah, Dennis, can I, can I ask you a question or two? You may. All right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to know, if possible, I know the river changes. My friends and I have done canoe and kayak trips on the Okmulgee, the Oconee, and the Altamaha. I know we've passed by that site numerous times. Uh, in your estimation, how close was the village to the river? And also... Um, once the Spanish went through, was there a depopulation because of disease? That can did you find that in the archaeological record at all? No, and that's one of the interesting things. Is um, well, the, to answer the first question, I think it was right on the river. There's a huge oxbow at the site, so the the modern current day river channel is about a mile away, but this oxbow which is very apparent, ran right by the site. And I think that was the active channel when the site was occupied. Um, the, the other question, tell me again. Uh, was there any evidence in the archeological oh, record? About the disease. Population? Yeah, no, um, not at the site. The, uh, you know, what's interesting is we're seeing, you know, certainly the encounters with DeSoto would have had some ugly effects. I'm sure there was uh, exchange of pathogens that uh, did uh, wind up killing people, but we don't see this, what we call depopulation. There was no, dec no evidence of decimation. And, um, uh, we see that in the fact that there are other sites, you know, that followed the glass site occupation in the 17th century and even maybe into the early 18th century uh, that are testament to the fact that there was, uh, you know, a, a viable native population still there, uh, even after the glass site. Um, it was, it was kind of, it became a, I mean, in a, 
there were, there was attrition, but it, you know, it wasn't like this epic die off. At least we don't see evidence of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll mention one other thing. Uh, you may remember we've corresponded some in the past, and I came to see you a couple of times at yep. the Bank. I thought that I had an article that you had written uh, with a map, but I can't find it. Uh, I see there's a uh, I see there's an article on the website called Redrawing Soto's Map, but I wasn't able to print any map. Have, have you published anything like that other than the little drawings in uh, in your book? No, I've never made an attempt to uh, reconfigure the route beyond this this uh, modification near the glass site. Um, I'm happy to send you the, the things that I've done that, that uh, makes that argument, but I haven't done anything more extensive. You know, I, I just don't have the basis to do that. I I have distinctly in the back of my mind, and I, I must be mistaken, that there was a map. And uh, I'm thinking that you identified the glass site with Ichizi. I, oh, yes. That was my, um, and I still think that's one of the possibilities in addition to Tama. Right. The, the problem with Ichizi is the narratives clearly say that it was before they came to this uh, eastward flowing river. So yeah, it usually was to the south of the Aldemar River or the Okamulgee River and the glass site is on the north side. Well, the glass site's on the, yeah, it is on the north side, but uh, anyway, with, this would be another conversation. I, I, here's what happened is they, they started uh, describing uh, meeting with envoys uh, who represented the uh, Lord of Achisi uh, some, some a day or two before they actually got to the capital town of Achisi. And so my estimation is that Achisi probably uh, started south of the Okmulgee, maybe in over in Ben Hill County, maybe almost about where the Alapaha River begins and extended over to um, the Okmulgee, or certainly at least they were active in that area. And then they did talk about, they crossed the great, they called it the Great River. And they, That's right. uh, they crossed the river to uh, the capital town, which I was arguing has, is possibly the glass site because of that necessary river cross. But, right. Um, Dr. Blanton, thank you very much for coming and speaking with us tonight. Well, it's uh, thank you, Jack, and thank you, Bill, and thank you all. Good to see Ansley and Dr. Noble and Bob and all my old friends. I hope to see you again, and uh, some of you I hope to. Oh, there's Tom McCray. Good Lord. There's Jeffrey. Thanks for being here. So at any rate, uh, I don't know. I'd rather see you in person. Do you have a mailing list or do we still reach out to you ind individually for your upcoming Southern Georgia field excavations? I will send information to uh, Jack and Bill and Manny. Yeah. about that and they can share it. Okay. That would be great. But, uh, and this is, you know, the, the chapter of SGA that I work with is uh, all, most often is the gas group, the greater Atlanta group. And so they will know as well. And so be happy to have everybody. But um, have a good evening. I'm gonna sign off. I, I regret that, but uh, it's been fun. And um, uh, thank you, Dennis. Keep up the good you, work Dennis. there. Yeah, see you thank later. You, Take, thank care. You, Take care. Bye. Thank you. Well, that was fun. Yes. That was good. Yes. Yes, it was. Good to see some familiar yeah. faces, too. Yeah. Thank you all for letting us crash again. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Always welcome. Yeah, really, Bill. Yeah. Uh, and we'll share our talk in March with you all. It'll be, uh, I think, Indus civilization focused. Okay. Who's giving the talk? Do you know? 
uh, a new a new person uh, over at Georgia State. She's she's not in anthropology, but she's working with a program that Nicola and I are working with. So, oh, cool. Uh, NYU PhD. Okay. Excellent. But yeah, thank y'all. That was great. Fun yeah. memories of working. Well, with thank you.